the reality is, like, when you saw what Gillette did with their... So Gillette always had these big masculine uh, commercials all about being a big, you know, hunter-provider kind of man. But then this huge U-turn after the Me Too campaign, and suddenly it was, prove you're not Harvey Weinstein or you can't have a Gillette product. And they absolutely tanked their sales in the same way that Budweiser did when they used Dylan Mulvaney, who suddenly decided in, in the mid-20s that, that, that this biological woman, uh, a man would be uh, identifying as a woman and make tens of millions of dollars uh, by almost mocking biological females. Um, and you see it time and again where they so grotesquely misjudge their audience. And look at now, they've just brought Shane Gillis on board, a comedian who was so spicy that SNL had to get rid of him. And in the same week, SNL bring him back as well. I think we might have passed peak woke. Yeah. I feel like we have. I feel that, I actually. think that... Yeah, I think that's, I think the, what I think happened, that's the, the undercurrent. The, the silent majority, which is a massive number of people, the silent majority just has got sick of it. They've got sick of everything they enjoy in life being redefined as somehow evil and corrupting and worthy of cancellation. They find the idea of the cancel culture completely ridiculous, but they also specifically like everything in their daily life that they enjoy, from comedy shows to movies to music to statues to heroes, whatever it is. The Woke Brigade's only response to all of it is it's all evil, it must all be cancelled, and we must go to a form of extreme puritanism where if you even crack a joke at work, you must be expunged from human life if it hasn't passed their humour test, which is obviously the worst outside of North Korea in the world. <laughs> Yeah, I think this tyranny of the minority has got very old and it was enforced through fear. It was enforced because if you make a joke or say a thing which is outside of this purity spiral Overton window of appropriateness, that is used as an indicator. It's a smoking gun. Oh, see, that one thing that Piers said, that slip up or that misspeak or that general speak that was a little bit clumsy. Or a genuine that shows joke, that which I just thought was a bit inappropriate but still funny. Exactly. Right? We used that to shows laugh that at he's them. secretly the racist, homophobic, xenophobic, yeah. anti-Semite, whatever, that we always knew that he was. And I think that people should turn their eye much more on the ones that throw accusations than the people that are being accused. Because I, I think it's a defense mechanism. I think that any time that someone is overly purity, nicey, nicey, like that uh, evil headmistress from Harry Potter, it's an indicator that, oh, hang on. What about you? Yeah. What's going on behind the scenes with you? And we yes. see this with late night shows in America. They're tyrannical behind the scenes, mm. but out front, nicer than nice. We see this with Lizzo, someone who's supposed to be standing up for these bigger girls and giving I them a platform. I thought Ellen DeGeneres was the forward. best one. Ellen DeGeneres, who led the kind of woke uh, campaign, uh, turned out to be an awful piece of work and ends up, of course, being cancelled herself at the altar of her own cancel culture. Yeah, the uh, standards you judge others by will be the standards that you are judged by. You should be very, very careful with that. Let me ask you, one thing that struck me about young uh, people is the amount of anxiety that exists in people you know, between the age of maybe like 25 and, and 17, 16. It's unbelievable and terrifying. And people are wrestling with why this is. And it's leading in many cases to them taking their own lives, but also massive amounts of medication in, in that mm -hmm. age bracket. What is going on here? I think that there is a pathologization and a medicalization and a glorification of normal human emotions. Mm. If you live in a world which is incredibly comfortable and typically day to day, you don't have to deal with that much uh, discomfort. You just did a segment and you were in a room that is pur purposefully designed to have heavy things in that you go in and pick up and put down in the same place. Yeah. It's called a gym. And that's because we have removed so many of the heavy objects that we need to live from daily life that we have to artificially create this and add it in. Mm. My point being that when existence is very comfortable, any discomfort feels like an aberration. It feels like a curse. And the more that we make existence comfortable and convenient, not to say I want air conditioning, mm. I like cruise control on a car, all of those things. but it makes people hypersensitized. I think on top of that, there is this very strange therapy culture speak where it is 
uh, the pathologization of normal human emotions. It's not that you're upset. It's that you're depressed. It's not that someone was mean to you. It's that they caused you trauma. We need to be very, very careful. And an ex Love Island contestant, Dr. Alex, who I think actually has some role at the, the British government, started a campaign that was like a uh, happy pills or take your to, like share your SSRI thing. And it's videos, IG videos of him putting with uh, SSRIs on his tongue. The amount of overprescription that we have at the moment for SSRIs is insane. The amount of people that are on these drugs no. that have very, very spurious uh, effects. They've been replication crisis quite heavily. There is a use for them, but it's not as wide as they should think. And there was a study that came out last week that said exercise is more effective than SSRIs. And then you just had a, a video that you put on the, the segment before this of some guy in the gym, maybe trying to battle away his demons, yes. maybe trying to stave off Being his humiliated use of SSRIs. By a woman. Who, who, if it had been the other way around, all hell would have broken loose. The hypocrisy and double standard is real. Also, I think with young people, and this is not just about young men, it's about women as well. Social media and and phones, cell phones, have completely changed things as well. And I think, obviously, a lot for good. I think they're very intelligent as a group of people, the ones I meet. They're very bright, they're sparky, they're well-informed. But they're getting a constant churn of dopamine, a lot of it very negative. They're seeing wars in real time all over their social right. media, the most horrific imagery. Uh, and they're seeing loads of other stuff just constantly bombarded with negative imagery. In a way that, you know, when I was young, you, it was unthinkable. You, had, you didn't have cell phones. There was, you know, maybe a television with two channels, very heavily sanitized and regulated. Uh, the newspapers were very cautious about what they put on their front pages and so on. You just did not get exposed to anything like this kind of sensory overload. How much do you think that is, is playing into this? Hugely. Jonathan Haidt's work on the coddling of the American mind. He's got a new book out soon called The Anxious Generation. It, it seems to be a huge impact. The human brain is not designed to consume the entire world's news, the worst of the world's news, disproportionately selected 24 hours a day in real time fed into our brains. I saw a meme the other day that said, sorry, I didn't reply to you. I'm trying to handle the entire world's information with a brain that was designed to collect nuts in a forest. <laughs> and it's yeah. so true. But it uh, is, we're but not it built for this. Yeah, it's, it's what's referred to as an evolutionary mismatch, that yeah. we have hypernormal stimuli in the modern world that we are not uh, developed to be able to deal with. I think one of the best things that everybody can do, I'm big into life hacks, right? You mentioned it on the show, on Modern Wisdom, we did this huge series of life hacks. The most high impact thing that people can do right now, sleep with your phone outside of your bedroom. Yeah. If you put the charging cable for your phone right now in the kitchen or in the hallway or somewhere else that isn't your bedroom, and before you go to bed in the nighttime, plug it in there, it will save, your sleep will improve, you won't be spending as much time on your phone, you won't be rolling over when you can't sleep during the middle of the night and using it, oh, your YouTube's only ever three feet away from you. And then on a morning, just try and delay that time as much as possible before you pick it up, because once you're in it, you get sucked in. So intermittent fasting for your phone, I'm, I'm all for it.